All right, hello and welcome everybody. Um, so I'm Professor Peter Tuttle at the University of Sydney. Um, and I'm Dr. Carr, but I'm not really a doctor. I'm only a medical doctor. I don't have a PhD like all of you people. I am not a scientist. I tell stories about science, which is why Peter invited me to come along for the ride. Peter is science, I'm the arts. Yeah, so this talk's a bit different from, uh, from what you've been hearing. Um, and this special presentation here is uh, awkwardly socially distanced from uh, each other and you. So uh, bear with us, we'll do our best with the format. Uh, and that's because Sydney's under lockdown right at this moment, thanks to this dude. Yes, COVID-19 is stressful, but we'd all like to take you back to a better, a kinder, a more gentler age. Cast your mind back more than two years ago. Remember the good old days when climate change was going to be the end of the world? Yeah, we're here for a nostalgia trip. So amazingly enough, our title slide here, some of you might recognise it was taken from Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth movie. And that's now 15 years ago. And since then, everything's all gone wrong. The carbon dioxide's only gone the wrong way. And last year alone, a fifth of Australia's forests burnt down in just one year. So unfortunately, the old apocalypse did not go away when the new one came, which is precisely why we are here today. Yes, we're here, Carl, on a mission to the astronomers. That's right, astronomers. Hang on, well, what does astronomy have to do with climate change? Everything, Carl. Astronomy's got everything to do it. And that's why we're calling on our fellow astronomers today. Here I go, calling. Astronomers, your planet needs you. Hang on, what do I mean? What, what does this have to do with astronomy? So, as everyone will see as we go through this talk, astronomy has a huge amount to say about this. Really? Hit me with your best card, your trump card. All right. So maybe the first and foremost thing, astronomy's got this duty to debunk this little pleasant fantasy that's out there in the public. And it, the, the fantasy goes a bit like this. Nice ride, Moe. Looks like a great way to get home. OK, we've all seen the random breath testing ads on TV. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so the problem, Carl, is that for the general public, there's this perception that if we really mess up this planet, then astronomers have a planet B for us. There's a, and the, the kind of plan for planet B goes a bit like this. Here's how it works. So we load you into a cannon, Carl, and then we fire you off up to that nice, one of those nice planets that people, you know, astronomers like me keep announcing every other week in the newspapers. Yeah, okay, look, looks good. Look, I, I look fine in my orange prison jumpsuit. I don't know why you put me in that, but speaking as a general member of the general public, that planet looks pretty cool to me. Yeah, that's a hydrant planet we landed you on, Carl. Hang on. Is that some sort of weird special astronomer name for a planet with water or something? No, it's uh, actually not a special astronomer name. It's actually a fire hydrant turned into a planet. It was all a project by a San Francisco artist who just used Photoshop, wandered around San Francisco photographing fire hydrants. Wow, so that is not actually that beautiful green and blue thing is not a planet. That's, that's just a colorized fire hydrant. Oh my God, okay. So uh, astronomers do actually have though, a, a, according to the general public, a bunch of real plan B planets, right? Uh, so no, that's actually the point. So really, uh, we don't have any planets that we could plausibly go to. And even if there were planets out there, um, this audience, all expert astronomers, they know how insanely difficult it would be to get there. So actually moving to a hyd fire hydrant and living there is probably more plausible. Okay, you've laid it on me fairly thick. There's no planet B. So what else do astronomers have to say on this? Well, that's the whole motivation for our talk, Carl. We're here to try and get the astronomers to save this one planet that we do have. So the point is that astronomy brings a whole fresh angle to this game. Ah, so you can cut through even to people who've been lied to by, for decades, since 1990 by the media. And so just to emphasize for our beautiful audience, we're not showing any new astronomy research. Instead today, we're showing how astronomers can use their their beautiful position and their knowledge to fight climate change. You're not yet politicised. You don't get egg like, uh, like my climate change scientist mates up in uh, Queensland. That's right. You need to use that trusted voice we have. And, and it actually cuts deeper than that. So maybe surprising to a lot of people, astronomy really is central to this whole science. Because after all, climate change is about the future. It's what happened tomorrow, what happens you know, in 10 years, 20 years time. It's a, nobody's got actually a crystal ball to predict this stuff. 
Ah, so you're saying that astronomers are the crystal ball? Exactly. So astronomers do a bunch of things that are completely related to climate change. We kind of get planetary energy budgets. We test and we can verify climate models beyond the conditions where they're tested on Earth. So that's what you need to extrapolate a model. And we can see the impacts of climate change on our neighbouring planets. Right. Now, because everything comes in threes, like the size of a triangle, or three days of the week, according to the country and Western singers, each one worse than the day before it, we've broken our, par, our talk into three parts. Part number one is the blue marble, planetary habitability. Part two, a morality play, the climate catastrophes next door. And part three, to cheer you up, the black marble, where we are heading today. So we'll dive into the blue marble, shall we, Peter? Yeah, let's just get cracking with it, Carl. So to this highly educated audience, we can kind of skip a lot of stuff today. So for everyone else, this is a talk about how to give a talk. It's kind of a meta talk. So we're going to go fast and just outline the thread that you might want to use when you speak to your students or to the public. So I think it's good to start here with an orientation of our place in the solar system with the sun and the planets all to scale. Ah, okay. And we've got, of course, our special planet and this special image of it, the blue marble, taken by the astronauts on Apollo 17. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is NASA's idea of a selfie. And it is regarded as possibly the most widely reproduced single image in the history of humanity. This image alone has its own Wikipedia page. And NASA, and remember we we're talking about artists, NASA, like all the great artists, they've done their selfies. And so the history goes back to Leonardo, to Vincent van Gogh. The selfie has become a meme in the art world Peter, let me lay it on you. All the great artists have done selfies. All right, Carl. I think that's enough from the arts. Let's move back quickly to the sciences. So uh, let's get right back to the blue marble. Okay, so what exactly is the blue marble showing us? Well, of course, the blue marble is the sunlit face of the Earth. And the Earth is there facing this solar nuclear furnace. It's putting out 10 to the 26 watts. So here on Earth, the entire planet intercepts only about one billionth of that energy, but that's still 40,000 terawatts. So, and of that, the Earth, uh, humans in intercept only 20 terawatts of power. Well, not from the sun, but we use, we humans use 20 terawatts, and there's another 39,980 going spare. Oh my gosh, that's huge, man. Yeah, that's the point. So the point is that there are these huge flows of environmental energy through the system. And even tiny changes in that vast flow can have really profound knock-on effects. So, so let's move along, Carl, and see how astronomers go about conceptualizing of these energy flows and energy budgets. So a kind of cool thing is that astronomers have developed this thing called a, like a, basically it's a real estate valuation scheme. And it's a thing called the habitable zone. Is that your fancy astronomy word for Goldilocks zone? Is that right? So for a hot star, you have to kind of keep back from the big hot fire. Is that right? Exactly. And if you're orbiting a cool red dim star, like an M dwarf. Ah, so you've got to cuddle up in close to stay warm. And then in between is in between. So we've got a range of orbits to stay in the Goldilocks zone. And that depends on how much power the sun is putting out. So where are we heading? So exactly. So astronomers have got a bunch of sophisticated models to calculate all this sort of stuff. But the basics of it, it's just balancing a budget. It's really simple. Energy out has got to be equal to the energy coming in. So um, astronomers in the audience, they're going to know all the basics like this. So we can skip through this pretty quickly. But the Earth loses energy according to its surface area, which is the pi r squared term there. And then there's, of course, the temperature of the Earth to the fourth power. So it's a very strong function of the temperature. So that's the outgoings. And then we've got to balance that with the incoming energy. And the first term here is the solar constant, which is just how much uh, sunlight there is at our orbital radius. And then there's a couple of other terms here. There's the albedo, or how much of the sunlight bounces right off and how much comes in. And then the, the sunlit face of the Earth. So when you're talking to the public, it's important to convey that there is a basic simple formula and that it works. Even if they're not going to follow the maths, it's good to know that there's some foundations to this. Okay, but if it's all this simple and constant, then surely the temperature would be very stable? Yeah, but in the real universe, of course, 
things are never completely stable. There's things called, astronomers called forcing factors. So the sunlight we get isn't that perfectly stable number that we just talked about. And people know these forcing factors already. They're things like seasons, orbits, uh, the changes in the sun with solar cycle. Right. And then with regard to the seasons, I'd like to point out, and this was uh, found in, two, in 1980, and uh, get the numbers exactly. You ready for it? 21 out of 23 Harvard University graduates and staff don't know what causes the seasons. They think that it's hot when the sun is close to the earth and vice versa. On the other hand, all you professional persons, you all astronomers know what causes the seasons. So that's short term forcing factors. Yeah, so we could also go along and talk about long term forcing factors. And again, you guys are on top of this. You've got it covered. There's things like Milankovitch cycles, solar activity, more to minimum, you can go into mini ice ages. Um, all of that stuff is, is are things that you can uh, argue about here. But, but the point comes up and the big reveal, Carl, are we ready for it? Here we go. One, two, and da-da, there it is. Bunch Here's of yellow. Here's the big reveal. Things. Okay, so take me through it. The point of this plot is that the yellow line shows you what the sun's been doing for the last 150 years. Um, that's the solar constant changing slightly with time, mainly through changes of activity of the sun. Um, and the red line is what the Earth has been doing. And for the first 100 years of this uh, data plot, you can kind of argue that the Earth's been tracking the sun. But the big reveal is just in the last 50 years, they've been tearing off in opposite directions. Ah, well, going back to my arts slant, you know who first predicted this? Is that a picture of who I think it is, Carl? You got it, Bill Labard. Really? Shakespeare, or Oxford, or anyway, whoever it is, moonlighting as a climate scientist? Sure, look, it's all there. If you, if you know how to read, if you see, if you're not a sheeple like everybody else, it's there. Cassius says so in Julius Caesar, and he says, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars, notice the plural, but in ourselves. And obviously he meant to say in our star, but it was a secret hint to us. Oh, he's talking about the sun. Oh, typo in the folio, Carl. You better check that one in before the typewriter, I might add. So, and the spell checker. <laughs> moving swiftly on, astronomy debunks this idea that climate change is driven by natural changes in the sunlight. But even more than that, astronomers have got this zoom lens. We've got this kind of time machine. We can zoom out and look at the prehistory of these systems, like our, our planets, over billions of years. So uh, when the sun was first born, astronomers know this, it was significantly fainter. And that leads to a puzzle, actually. How did we stay warm? There's a paradox there called the faint young sun paradox. And look, honestly, look, don't worry about it, having paradoxes. I think it is important, in fact, when talking to the general public to convey the humility of science that you don't know everything. We're still working on some of the answers. I don't know those three words. That's an incredibly powerful answer that builds, and let me emphasize this, long-term trust. Long-term trust. So going long-term from the beginning of the solar system up to today, it's nice and comfy, but oh no, it's going to get messy. In less than a billion years, we're going to find that the sun will, due to its gradual, very slow increase in luminosity, uh, it'll get so hot that the oceans will boil. The biosphere will run away. We'll move away from the habitable zone or it'll leave us. We'll get a runaway greenhouse effect. And then, just to make it even worse, a few billion years after that, the sun will start to expand and swallow up the v Mercury and probably Venus and maybe Earth and possibly even Mars. And then it'll shrink down again into a pathetic little white dwarf and it'll stay like that for billions of years and the sterile ashes of the Earth will orbit the sun's dying ember for trillions of years, alone in the frigid darkness as the entire universe descends into the unstoppable and unrelenting heat death. Nice bedside manner with that, Carl. Do you make children cry at your shows? Uh, only when I tell what I think is the truth about uh, Superman, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. But I'm glad you brought that up because scary tales is exactly where we're heading next. So now we're heading into part two. We've done part one, the blue marble. Now we're heading into part two, a solar system morality play. Yeah, so here on Earth, we're super lucky because we've got these two neighboring planets, uh, Venus and Mars, and they kind of probe the habitable zone for us. You know, Venus is there on the too hot side and Mars is just outside 
uh, beyond the too cold edge of the Goldilocks orbit. So um, to a lot of people, the solar system looks like the parable of like Odysseus and the sea monsters. Ah, and I can see there that you've cleverly put a graphic of the Earth on the sail, so uh, on the ship. So that means that the Earth has to, being a metaphor, has to sail a narrow line, while Mars and Venus both got eaten by the climate monsters on each side of the habitable zone. Yeah, so if you actually look into it, though, that story is not nearly as neat and simple as it sounds. And so we need to understand the basic physics of what sets a, planetary's, a planet, planet's temperature? Well, of course, the basic thing is the distance between that planet and the host star. And the first basic calculation to assume is a black body. So yes, we, we think of the planet as just being a black ball of iron, absorbing everything, no atmosphere. And then you sophisticate, I've used the word as a verb there, you sophisticate eyes, your model, by changing it from a black body into a body that's got varying degrees of reflectivity or shininess or albedo. And then you make it even more realistic by chucking in an atmosphere. So looking at our three terrestrial planets and treating them as a, just a plain ball of iron, you see these temperatures related in a nice, easy, steady, unbelievable way from warmer to cool with the ordering from the sun of plus 54 down to minus 48. And that all makes sense. Now, we say, okay, it's not going to be just simply absorbing all the radiation. It's going to have some degree of reflectivity or albedo, to use your fancy astronomy word. And when we chuck that in, we find a bunch of numbers. What's going on with Venus at minus 95? What's that all about? Yeah, that, it's bizarre, isn't it? So Venus is actually equilibrium temperature is colder than the Earth, despite its proximity to the sun. So that's because like Venus is actually the shiniest disco ball in the solar system. It reflects almost all of the sunlight that's landing on it. It's almost as white or arguably, it's a toss up between Venus and Enceladus. What's the, the shiniest object? So that cold temperature is because the sunlight can't get in. Right, okay, so what we've done is we've gone from a black body to a body that is actually the right amount of albedo. Now let's start chucking in the atmosphere and the temperatures that we get are, as observed, are Oh my gosh, look at that red 500, 33.8. Now I'm guessing with Venus, it's got roughly 100 times more atmosphere than the Earth. The Earth has got as much atmosphere as the Earth, of course, and Mars has got roughly 160. So the thin atmosphere on Mars is not up to the job of keeping the place habitable. Yeah, exactly. So Venus and Mars are both super inhospitable today, uh, but it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always so early Mars, certainly, uh, had a temperate climate with standing water and recent research we'll talk about suggests Venus might have also had a temperate climate for up to half of its history. So these three planets are the characters that we're going to um, act out our morality play here today. And so we've got Venus, which is this uh, furnace, a searing hell, plus 460. We've got a nice balmy earth with a beach there and we also got a frozen desert of Mars. Um, so what we need to do for our play is tell the story of how these got to be the way they are. So in the first place, let's just start with Venus. Um, well, yeah, okay, look, Venus is much closer than we are, or is closer to, than we are to the sun. So how can we think that it could have possibly have had a temperate climate? Yeah, so this is actually pretty new research in the last sort of five or 10 years, and it's still not completely settled. But the best models we have predict that Venus was able to pull off this really miraculous trick. And it relies on the fact that the planet has quite slow rotation. So as the ocean rolled around to the day side, it boiled up a big shield of clouds. And they, like Venus does today, reflected off most of the sunlight. But the key difference is that in early, in the first half of Venus's history, on the night side, the clouds all uh, dispersed, allowing a cold, clear night to Venus to vent off its heat back to space. But unfortunately for Venus, uh, there came a day when it couldn't keep up this clever juggling act. Uh, things got a bit too hot, um, possibly the proximity to the sun, factors of geology, maybe a bunch of things factored in, but it got too hot and it lost its oceans. They boiled up into the atmosphere. And on that day was a bad day to be on Venus because uh, a runaway greenhouse effect uh, kicked in 
And from that point, there's been no going back. Venus essentially today has lost all its hydrogen. Even if you could cool it back down to a habitable temperature, you couldn't restore the oceans. There's no hydrogen to make the water. Ah, irreversible. So we do have one example next door, the next rock into the sun of climate change, which unfortunately is both catastrophic and irreversible. Bummer, man. What about Mars? So, of course, for early Mars, the evidence that it did have early in its history, a mild climate with standing water, is now overwhelming. Uh, but unfortunately for Mars, things probably went wrong pretty quick. Uh, and the main problem for Mars is not, in fact, its location further out in the solar system away from the sun. It's actually that Mars is a bit too small. Um, it doesn't have enough gravity to hold its atmosphere tightly. It's too small to hold a, a keep a hot interior with all of these clever geological processes we'll come to about recycling atmosphere, can't maintain a magnetic field. So all of these things meant that Mars failed to protect its atmosphere. So we've ended up with this frozen desert we see today underneath a stripped atmosphere. OMG. So once again, next rock out is catastrophic and irreversible in its version of climate change. Isn't that two out of two? That's two for two. And there's actually another lesson here you might convey to the public if you give these talks. That is that the same models, the same physics that we use here on Earth can nail these planets. We can get the exact conditions, the day, night, the seasons, everything. We can get Venus right, we can get Mars right. So that's taking our climate models and using them out in an environment where they were never initially calibrated for and they work. Um, so let's also move on to try and get a handle now, not on the present conditions, but also on the past. Ah, so how do these factors play out on Earth then? What sets the climate? Well, so the first thing to point out is that Earth is blessed with this healthy, strong greenhouse effect. Hang on, greenhouse effect is good and blessed? B-L-E-S-S-E-D, -S is that how you say it? Yeah, so remember a couple of slides back, we, we talked about the Earth without a greenhouse effect, we'd be living on a, a snowball at minus 18 degrees Celsius. So we need that greenhouse effect, we need that blanket, and, and here's how it works. So the atmosphere, the gas in the atmosphere, acts as a one-way valve for solar energy. It's a super neat trick, and it's all to do with the interaction between light and the molecules in the atmosphere. So the sun, sunlight comes down in the visible part of the spectrum, and basically just sails straight through. Almost all of it gets down to the ground to warm uh, the planet up. But then when the Earth goes to try and lose that heat back to space to stay cool, only a trickle gets back through the atmosphere. Only a small fraction can escape back up. So um, I reckon we can demonstrate this, Carl. There's a, it's time to do an experiment. Let's do a prac class in climate change. Hang on, haven't the big fossil fuel companies, just a few dozen of them, already been doing that to the entire human race and the civilization and the planet we live on? Yeah, good point. They have been experimenting, uncontrolled experiment, by the way. But we can do an experiment in the lab, and you might be able to set one of these up in your lab. All you need is a thermal camera, a thermal infrared camera. So we're filming here both in visible light normal camera and then also and that's of course where the sunlight comes down to warm up a planet and also at 10 microns where the earth needs to radiate its heat back out into space so in a way in this demo my head is standing in for a little planet we're doing the energy budget of my head and if you zoom in you get a better close-up you can see the hot spots inside my mouth and in the inner aspects of my eye sockets um, but now it's time to talk about the greenhouse effect and how that changes this balance. So firstly, notice that both in the visible and the infrared at the moment, you can easily see my eyes. But now we're gonna show you what climate change has got to do with greenhouses. What's it got to do with growing vegetables underneath glass? So it turns out that glass has got this remarkable superpower. It lets in visible light completely, but it blocks out the infrared. So you just saw when I put on the glasses, I put on a one-way valve, it's still letting the light fall on my face, but it's not letting any of the heat escape back out. 
Well, okay, we've, you've, you've done the greenhouse carbon dioxide thing, but the other possibility from, besides we've seen what you look like in different wavelengths, is that that famous pop artist, Andy Warhol, secretly used infrared film for illustration and in inspiration. And that's where we get our iconic image of Marilyn Monroe coming from. All the great scientists on having a sideline in science. Okay, fine with that. So I'm fine with greenhouse, and, and, but show me how this is related to carbon dioxide. Well, I, I am hoping that's the first and the last time I'm compared to Marilyn Monroe in a public forum, Carl. But moving swiftly along, um, the second demo that you might want to think about doing to your students uh, deploys this little gizmo you can get called a capnograph. You might be able to borrow one from a local hospital. Um, and I think, Carl, in your past lives, you might have uh, encountered these gizmos. Yeah, I used to be a doctor in the kids' hospital and a few other hospitals, and they're used in intensive care to monitor people. And you don't want to go into intensive care. If you can do what they call uh, bed and breakfast, you come in overnight, you leave the next morning, you'll walk away pretty fine. But if, in your, if you're in intensive care for, say, two days, it'll pro and you get ventilated, it'll probably take you from two weeks to two months to get back to normal, where you can just walk down the street. You do not want to go in intensive care. If you're heading into intensive care, normally you're really close to dying. And the doctors use this in intensive care and they shine a beam of infrared light. You can see that red arrow. And that infrared light will get absorbed by carbon dioxide. So over on the right-hand side, we've got Peter about to blow into a tube. And what he's going to blow into it is not the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to be Peter's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is roughly 21% oxygen and 0.04% carbon dioxide. And that's the stuff coming into Peter's lungs. And by the way, if anybody ever says to you that anything as small as 0.04% can't affect anything at all, well, the blood alcohol level is 0.05% and that's pretty close. So that's coming in. So, but Peter's atmosphere, what's coming out of him is 17% oxygen and 4% carbon dioxide. That's a 100% increase in carbon dioxide. And we should see that the capnograph fires up whenever Peter blows out. Take it away, Peter, and he's about to blow. And you can see over here, the little line at the bottom going up and then down, and then it's coming back up again. See, it's going up there. Uh, that's carbon dioxide going out, and now he's breathing in. So the capnograph uh, tells us uh, that Peter is in fact not a robot. So that was one in breath and one out breath. Yeah, so the cool thing about this demo is that it immediately and tangibly demonstrates two things that anything with a metabolism, and luckily I'm not a robot, so I have a metabolism. Uh, also, in, you can extend the idea of a metabolism out to motor vehicles and stuff. Anything with an engine emits carbon dioxide. You can see it right there on the trace. The second thing it shows is that the detection um, mechanism used by this little device is actually the absorption of infrared light by carbon dioxide. So it's exactly the same um, physical process that we're worried about for carbon dioxide's effect on the greenhouse effect, uh, the greenhouse layers of gas in our own atmosphere. So um, let's move there now, Carl, and look at how this greenhouse physics has played out over geological time. So um, the red line on this plot is a 4.6 billion years, so the whole of Earth's history, and that's kind of as near as we can guess it, the Earth's temperature record over this vast sweep of, of history. And you can see it's kind of bumpy, but there's an important dotted blue line in the middle I want to point out for a start. Um, when the Earth is colder than that level, we think uh, it can support polar ice caps. But when it's warmer than that, uh, the ice caps melt. So we, Earth won't have any, uh, any frozen polar caps. So one thing that's a bit sobering straight away is that the episodes in history where the polar caps were present seem pretty rare. We live in an unusually cold Earth right now. Um, the second thing to point out is, yeah, is the, the line through the middle which says the present temperature. So, yeah, we're only just below that limit where um, Earth can sustain polar ice caps. And um, so, yeah, maybe take it away from here, Carl. Yeah, so for most of us here, history of this climate was hotter. So we've now seen how Venus and Mars went off the rails. And that's sad. They, they went off irreversibly. 
so how come if the Earth's temperature has been bumpy, and, and look at that, it, it's been up and down, bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. How come it always stayed within those narrow limits? How come it's been remarkably stable? How on Earth did our lucky planet pull that one off? Well, that'd be the thermostat, Carl. The thermostat? What do you mean? I didn't get any email about the Earth thermostat. Who knew the Earth had a thermostat? Where I didn't get the memo. Well, it's actually a kind of a cool thing called the carbonate silicate cycle. It's kind of a geochemical process. And uh, we can explain that. It works a bit like this. So it all starts with carbon dioxide being vented into the air by volcanoes. And then um, when it rains, the rain dissolves some of that carbon dioxide out of the air and it rains to the ground as a slightly acidic uh, liquid called carbonic acid. You're probably familiar with this. That's where limestone caves come from. It dissolves minerals. And over time, this process has the effect of scrubbing the carbon dioxide out of the Earth's atmosphere and sort of sequestering it chemically down into sediments uh, and the ocean floors. And from there, uh, geological processes drag it underground. And eventually it goes far enough down underground that it encounters some hot magma. And then it gets uh, vented up into the atmosphere out of a volcano. Okay, so that's the sort of a cycly thing, but take me more into the actual thermostat thingy wingy. Yeah, so the thermostat, it's a good question, it works this way. Um, so suppose for a moment that the climate gets a bit colder, then more of the Earth's surface is protected underneath snow and ice, the rain can't reach it, uh, there's also less rainfall, uh, doesn't dissolve the carbonic acid out of the air, there's just less weathering. So what you've done there is you've, the, the processes that scrub the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere start to falter, but the volcanoes don't care. Volcanoes don't give a, a, a toss whether it's cold or hot day. They just keep spewing out carbon dioxide, um, whatever the weather is like. So with nowhere to go and it continues to build up in the atmosphere, um, of course, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So here we find that eventually that leads to greenhouse warming. And of course, the reverse process happens. Climate gets a bit warmer, you get more rain, more weathering, uh, more carbon dioxide scrub out of the atmosphere. It goes quicker than the volcanoes can replenish it. You lower the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere and that results in a cooler Earth. And in fact, this whole process, we believe, um, occurred when the Asian plate got slammed into by India, raising the Himalayas. So there was an enhanced weathering in fact, the present cold snap Earth finds itself in is probably due to the enhanced weathering thrown up by the, the mountain range up in the monsoonal band of the Earth's um, equator. Wow, so the Himalayas, by being created and being pushed up from dead flat, gave us this current cooling thing. Okay, look, overall, I'm seeing great news here. We have a thermostat to regulate the temperature to keep water, not as a solid, not as a gas, but liquid most of the time in most of the places. That's exactly right. And eventually that thermostat will recover Earth back to its set points. But there's bad news, Carl. That is that that thermostat takes about a million years half a million to a million years in order to make an adjustment. And climate change is going way too fast for these geological processes to make a dent. Ah, so the moral of this play, so we're in part two, remember? Blue planet number one, moral play number two. The, the climate change has happened to both of our neighbours and uh, that was both catastrophic and irreversible. And that secondly, that the terrestrial climate models perfectly predict what we've got here in our current Venus and Mars, they're in excellent shape. Uh, early Venus and Mars, we're still working on it. So in the case of Earth, we weren't just lucky in getting parked here in our orbit. We had active processes maintaining our climate and they've stopped us from going off the rails. And the, and the moral is this in our morality play. Well, two of the three characters, Venus and Mars, have failed. But looking at us, well, thanks to a few dozen fossil fuel companies, our, and, and it's directly one-to-one -one relationship, thanks to a few dozen fossil fuel companies, our atmosphere has already warmed by one centigrade degree. And if you like the Aesop's fables, the moral could be something like, hey dudes, let's not stuff it up. So I think, Peter, it's time to head into part three, the last stage of our talk, the black marble. Exactly. So NASA got such a good deal from the blue marble, 
their publicity thought, well, a little bit is good, more is better. They wanted a new hit. So they launched a major project to take images of the night side of the Earth. So, Carl, when we did the blue marble, you characterised that as NASA taking a selfie. So uh, this new one isn't characterised as like a selfie where the sun don't shine. This, I really hope for our sake this is not a risky click coming up, Carl. Well, firstly, art is everywhere and does everything. And uh, secondly, risk is part of the job when climate change is involved. And we're on this treadmill and we've got to go and make it better. So to bring this home, we have to ask if our models can do this for us, if our knowledge can do this. Um, can we explain uh, the Earth's climate variation, why we are so unique, and also where we are headed if we keep on burning fossil fuels? Yeah, so the first point, Carl, where the bumpy ride comes from, um, it's important to realise that Earth is alive and it's not that just that life exists on Earth, it's here in such abundant profusion that life has been the agent that's profoundly changed the way this planet works. And you kind of, the more you study astronomy and the audience are doing this all the time, the more you realise just how deeply weird Earth actually is. Um, now, here's a beautiful image from the Cassini uh, spacecraft. And what you see here is a much more typical scene to an astronomer. They're relaxing now. This is familiar. This is what they're used to seeing. So we see Saturn's rings and Epimetheus. But in the background there, we see the fuzzy atmosphere of Titan. And everywhere we look in the universe, we see stuff like this. We can see, we can find you oceans and lakes of things like propane, methane, hydrogen, much of it as you want. But in fact, if an extraterrestrial came from one of those environments and they're looking back at Earth, um, they would look at us and think, oh my God, nothing could live there. That's, that's a toxic, weird, noxious soup of gas they live under there. And the whole idea of what is fuel is turned on its head everywhere else in the universe. Here we think of fuel as those things like propane, got to go down to Bunnings and buy a canister of that. But almost anywhere else in the universe, the real fuel the real rare stuff would be the oxygen. Peter, you have just satisfactorily messed with my head to think that the real fuel is oxygen in most of the universe. So let's try and mess with the audience's head. Here's a quiz for you over here underneath the question marks. What are we looking at? And if you want a quick answer, go and look it up in Cody's laboratory. It looks like we're getting two flames and looking at the first one, that's the flame you get when you have an atmosphere of air and the incoming gas down at the bottom is propane, right? So that's the flame you get when you burn propane in air, when you make that chemical reaction happen that way. But if you flip things around where you have an atmosphere of propane and the incoming gas instead is oxygen, then you get a similar but different looking flame. And I'd like to point out to you that remember this the next time you go and have a barbecue on Titan. Exactly, Carl. So the question really begs is, is how did Earth get like this? Like, where did we get this oxygen from? And to figure that out, we've got to again go back that 4.6 billion years. So at the beginning, we think Earth had a pretty typical uh, start in life, ball of lava with the usual constituents in the atmosphere. But pretty soon after, these bugs called cyanobacteria got busy. Uh, you can still go see them today if you want. They're alive in the famous stromatolites in Western Australia. And they produce oxygen as a waste product. And that's all fine um, because at the time, for most of the first part of Earth history, the iron just got soaked up, sorry, the oxygen got soaked up by iron that was dissolved in the ocean. Um, so the iron formed rust, the rust sank to the floor of the sea, and that was there to make future Western Australian mining tycoons very rich. But there came a day when the iron all got used up. The oceans ran clear. There's nowhere for it to soak up to anymore. But the bacteria kept at it. Um, producing the oxygen had nowhere to go. So it had to go into the atmosphere. So this moment was called the great oxidation event or the great oxidation catastrophe. It was one of the biggest mass extinction events in the fossil record. There's this toxic, noxious gas everywhere called oxygen. So we come along to the present day and life only got um, going stronger at this and we ended up with about one part in five oxygen in our atmosphere here. So the oxygen ended up here to stay, but notice over here on that beautiful blue line of oxygen that there's this sudden kick 
and the oxygen level went up to about 30, 35%. And that was back in the so-called Carboniferous period, about a third of a billion years ago, where there were trees and vegetation everywhere making oxygen like crazy. And that's how we got the fossil in fossil fuels. So that's a legacy of our bioengineered living planet. But it kind of seems weird, like it shouldn't exist. We've got all this oxygen. And if you've got an oxidizing atmosphere, well, then the potential fossil fuel is actually food that hasn't been eaten. And it turns out that all of the fossil fuels come from very special environments. And that's where there's either little, that means suboxic uh, environment, or no oxygen anoxic. Uh, environment. So there are your two possibilities, hardly any or absolutely none, or close to, nothing's absolute, very close. So take, for example, peat bogs, and people still use these for fuel today. And then when you do uh, the tr process of getting heat, and once again, you add three things to it. Remember, everything comes in threes, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, each one worse than the one before it. When you add heat and pressure and time underground, the geologists say that it actually cracks. So there's a phrase cracking and you end up getting fossil fuels like coal and natural gas. And what you've noticed is that there's no oil. There's no oil. Where does the oil come from? From these guys here, the anoxic environments, it comes from anoxic environments. That's where oil comes from, deep lakes and ocean floors. Exactly, so let's go a bit more into oil, Carl. Um, we only find it from certain periods in geology. And in the modern ocean, we believe there's probably no oil being formed. And that's because uh, we've got these polar caps. And at the, at the poles, cold, salty water is very, very dense and it sinks. Um, and that forces cold water down into the depths. And then that's got to rise back up at the equator, driving these big currents. You probably encountered some of these currents. The famous Gulf Stream is part of this physics, which is called thermohaline circulation, sort of a global circulation pattern. Um, and the important part about thermohaline circulation is that it keeps the entire ocean ventilated. So that means there can be life all the way through the water column right to the bottom so that a dead fish, dead plankton, anything falling down through that water column gets eaten, it can rot. But what happens in those periods of history, and we saw before most of Earth's history, when there were no ice caps? Well, when there's no ice cap, there's no thermohaline circulation, no current, no oxygen, and there can be no life down there. And this is the situation that geologists believe was the way the Mesozoic Ocean or previous episodes of history, um, when there were no caps, and most of these fossil fuels like oil was formed, and we had an entire ocean water column that was stagnant, dead, and anoxic. So dead stuff falling through the water column, dead fish couldn't rot. They just form deep layers on the ocean floor of sediment. They end up as this mineral called shale. Take that into geology, crack it, and you end up with fossil fuels. And in fact, if we burn all the fossil fuels, we could, if we tried, return the oceans to this dead stagnant stage by melting the ice caps to this dead stagnant stage with no oxygen. And in fact, we have already started with ocean anoxia. And you can see these red circles as being anoxic zones where the deep water is so low in oxygen that sea life cannot survive. But we're actually doing it on land via a slightly different complicated pathway. But the bottom result is that we're ending up with via anoxia, two episodes, uh, 2018, 2019, of millions of fish dead in the Murray-Darling area. And the one thing you notice about these dead fish is that they ain't moving. Unlike this fish here, which is both dead and moving. Let me just say that again. This fish has been dead for a few days and it is still moving. And the paper from 2006 in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics talks about passive propulsion in vortex waves. And look at the first three words of the abstract, a dead fish. So the dead fish swimming is not caused by biology or physiology, it's caused by physics. Hooray for physics and hydrodynamics. And is there magic or perpetual motion involved? No, the energy to make the fish swims comes from the moving water. So Carl, what you're telling us is that climate change might kill us all, but well, our dead bodies are gonna be able to keep swimming through it. 
Uh, number one, you're really good at reading between the lines of what I said to get what I really meant. And secondly, you're right. I always do try to look for the silver linings in physics. Yeah, well, I think I'm going to go for the fire hydrant as my plan B. Um, you can go with the dead fish swimming. Um, but let's, let's wrap this baby up, Carl. Um, let's go back to the black marble. So we conclude here with this beautiful image from one of NASA's black marble series. This is in fact part of North America, North Dakota. Um, and you can see the cities here strung along like jewels along the interstate highways. Um, and when this image was first released, uh, people started to notice funny things in pictures like this. Well, like, hey, actually, well, that's actually North Dakota. There is no big city in North Dakota, but there's this major clump of lights that's sort of rivaling Washington or New York there. What's going on? Well, actually, it turns out that that big clump of lights isn't a city at all. It's uh, an oil shale formation called uh, the Barkin Shale Formation. And what you're seeing there is a phenomenon called flaring, which is the when miners burn off or flare uh, unwanted natural gas coming out of their wells. Now that sounds horrendously wasteful and blasting titanic amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for no gain for anyone, no, no gain in energy. And that's true, except that the alternative, which is to allow the methane into the atmosphere without burning it off, is about 80 times more potent a greenhouse gas than the carbon dioxide is. So it's far better to let Carbon di wasteful carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than methane. So, so here we go to the big take home message. This is your call to arms. Astronomer, go out there and defend your planet. Steal our slides, make them your own, plagiarize, plagiarize, let nobody else's work evade your eyes, get the good work out. Exactly. Take all of these resources, make your own, put them to your Spread students or your uh, peer groups, use them for good. Yeah, remember, all that is needed for evil to triumph is that good people do nothing. This is the time to step up. We are giving you a mental toolbox to fight the good fight. And Peter and I separately have made a set of five videos on climate change. And just to finish off here, from my sort of point of view, I wrote my first story on climate change in 1981. And now it's four decades later. Yeah. And uh, as this stunning imagery from the Black Marble series reveals, there is still so much worth fighting for on this planet. So everyone go boldly forth, spread the words. Um, and uh, Carl and I are going to hang around after this talk. Uh, if you have questions, please come to the sustainability session immediately after this. Bring your lunch. Uh, we'll be hanging out there uh, and we'd be, love to see you there. Okay.